Je suis un architecte contextuel. Mais le contexte, pour moi, ce n'est pas uniquement le site. C'est vraiment, euh, avant tout, euh, un contexte historique beaucoup plus large, euh, un contexte culturel. Euh, et euh, effectivement, construire euh, dans les pays arabes, sont très différents d'abord, euh, mais à chaque fois, c'est essayer de, de, de continuer une histoire et d'intervenir dans, 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 dans cette histoire. Je crois qu'un bâtiment a toujours des liens, a toujours, a toujours des racines. Et euh, je me vois mal faire euh, à Paris un bâtiment qui pourrait être euh, à Doha et à Doha un bâtiment qui pourrait être à Paris. Ça me paraît difficile. Pourtant, quand vous arrivez là-bas, il y en a quelques-uns qui pourraient être dans les deux endroits. Euh, et euh, donc, ce n'est pas uniquement euh, une question d'intégration au site, comme on dirait, comme selon ce qu'on nous apprend à l'école. Euh, C'est une intégration dans une profondeur historique. C'est un témoignage, à un moment donné, euh, d'une influence culturelle qui vient changer la donne. I guess I always had. This is, I, I find this nothing special. I go somewhere and I think it's rather easy to feel the space and see it and so and have an idea how I should react there as an architect. So I go to South Korea and then I mean in a Catholic theme park, I never seen anything like that. And the priest wants me to do a chapel and the highest point there and so on. And then it's interesting to observe. I seem to know a lot. And then we, and this has to do with the fact that we all know a lot. <laughs> we have read books, we have seen movies, it's a big world. It's, They call it globalization or whatever. But since I'm young, uh, Japanese architecture, Chinese architecture, and so this has been part of education. Chinese, classical Chinese architecture is in the work of Mies van der Rohe. You can look at it, find out, and he looked there. So it's a bit, uh, it's not such a mystery. I'm sure there are places where it becomes more nature less cultivated nature, more direct hard nature like sea or mountain or desert. I, I think we know about this and I have developed a feeling, I have then a feeling for this. La culture est toujours un lien entre les entre les différentes civilisations. Euh, C'est peut-être la façon la plus... la première façon de pouvoir se comprendre Ce sont par des expressions euh, qui témoignent d'une sensibilité, euh, qui sont souvent des expressions euh, d'une certaine ab abstraction. Euh, C'est vrai avec les arts plastiques, c'est vrai avec la musique, c'est vrai avec l'architecture, par exemple. Aujourd'hui, ce sera vrai de plus en plus avec toutes les images qui, qui envahissent les réseaux. Euh, donc je crois que tout ça crée du lien, effectivement, et, et permettra de faire évoluer le monde. Euh, L'architecture, euh, c'est pour cela qu'elle ne doit pas toujours être la même. Elle doit parler du, à chaque fois de quelqu'un. Elle ne peut pas être la même dans le monde entier. Elle doit, elle, 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 elle doit bien parler pour quelqu'un. Elle doit bien témoigner des désirs de quelqu'un. Je crois que l'architecture, c'est écouter. What I think is interesting here is that this global or globalization of, of architecture gives some architects, us among some, uh, a chance to, to work in different cultures and, 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 and bring our culture in there, but at the same time be impacted. I think it would be a disaster if we did a Scandinavian building in Nigeria where we're building right now. We are doing a building in Nigeria that should be Nigerian, but is heavily influenced by Nordic thinking. And, and I think that, that that's the whole difference of, of approach uh, of someone. You know, it's the opposite of the Coca-Cola idea. The, the, the nice thing about a Coca-Cola is that it's the same thing all over the world. 
I don't even drink it, but I know it's the same product. If you did that in architecture, it would be a disaster. Having the opportunity to see both worlds and even many worlds uh, I, is, is uh, an incredible source of inspiration. I think I'm most inspired by the environment and I travel a, a whole lot because that's really my source of inspiration, you know. Just being here, looking here um, already influences my thought and how, however subtle. Um, and even though architecture takes a lot from being site specific, it also is something that we completely decontextualized in terms of just being inspired by something different, but you suddenly realize it has a strong influence on something that is um, somewhere else. So in a way, with, my, with architecture, I really, um, my projects, um, I hope and I work to sort of generate solutions that are that seem like they belong there at the same time they look like they came out of nowhere. More difficult to understand the people. More difficult to see what are they what do they mean when they say this? This I know in Bavaria, this I know in Switzerland, this I know in Austria, this is my area. I know exactly well the way when they talk and what they mean, and what they don't say and mean, and so all these things. This is diff more difficult in Russia. <laughs> so when I talk to them, uh, the, these friendly, warm-hearted people, but there's always a, a secret agenda I don't understand. If I be a Russian, I don't understand. <laughs> that's more... That's. That's not what you're asking, but that's what I'm saying. This is more difficult to understand, really. Place is not, for me, that's so difficult. Everything is different. I mean, starting with, of course, landscapes and the sun and uh, the climate and uh, the people and the culture and the history, but also building codes, you know, technologies, uh, uh, traffic, systems. Everything is different from one place to another. And that's why architecture, the way we do it right now, is kind of interesting because every project is, in a way, a prototype. We, we are naive enough sometimes to pick up some of the strongest things in local cultures which they themselves take for granted. And that, of course, is the strength of coming from the outside. It's like being researching things again, reinterpreting, retranslating. And from that point of view, you give something back. What is architecture for me? Uh, what is architecture for somebody that is coming from a place where infrastructure is uh, not existing, but it's needed? Uh, what is architecture for somebody like this? Uh, it's simply, it's more than building buildings. It's just more than creating a piece of, of work that can be seen as art. It's more than that. It is something that happening that is a process on how together with people you think about the project at the end to come out with something that people really feel uh, it is our own we are part of it it is something that we have a strong identification with it we see ourselves in that so that is how i see architecture Architecture really starts with people, you know, so I, um, it is about the experience that you uh, generate 
or you create or you curate um, with people and for people and hopefully by people. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always very interested in ensuring that architecture addresses at least um, that sort of social uh, and perhaps environmental um, aspects of, of, of living. Um, because I think these are fundamentally two of our most important challenges of, of today, the growth of the human population and the changing climatic condition of the environment. So my motivation was to create infrastructure for my people. So, but with lack of financial means. So this is how it came that I tried both to use local material, mostly clay and wood, and then to come out with the modern uh, uh, articulation. So to create the building that is modern. Um, this is important because people reject those old materials. They just consider clay. Uh, clay is a poor people material, so building material. So nobody want to have it. It's not modern. So what I did is just to use this very known material that is easily to be used and is used by every people since people can think in my home country and then to create a new building, to create something that is appealing, something that is working, something that people can say, wow, this is something new. Things are different in Bahrain than in Saudi, than in uh, Egypt or Morocco. I mean, our approach again is, is sense of cooperation, trying to involve all parties from very, very early. So the process almost becomes a self-driving element towards a possible result. For that particular building, for instance, we took the local tile and porcelain producing company and gave them a massive job. It was at a time when Rasl Kaima, which doesn't have oil, were trying to develop their own social status. And what they have is clay. They have fantastic clay to build uh, and to create and to produce the most fabulous porcelain or, or ceramic tiles. So we created a building which would enhance that particular industry and lift the knowledge base simply by introducing a very heat reflective surface on this building and at the same time introducing for the first time uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, huge span roofs for electrical production because they don't have oil. So you look for employment, you look for local production, you look for maintaining smaller elements in societies that might enhance that society. It's not about the architecture only, but it's how you approach that architecture and how you do it. You become so much more informed by talking to somebody who comes from a completely different culture and sees different, uh, see things differently. A good example is we had a discussion about a big project in China and we were, we were a group sitting here and, um, and we, we came into this philosophic discussion about how do you mature a city and what is a good city. And after European standard, if a city is like a couple of hundred years, it's pretty, it's getting there somehow. But 200 years is a long time. And then we have this Chinese guy sitting here and he's a very young, he just started in the office and then he's raising his hand saying, but 200 years, we cannot wait in China 200 years. That's eight generations for me. We need the city now and what is the problem? And you have to kind of rethink the whole thing. And we came back and say, okay, yeah, that, of course, we cannot wait 200 years. What is that a crappy approach to have? You know, that's a European idea of a city, but that's not what we are facing out in, let's say, Asia or Africa at the moment. We have to act now. Perhaps over time, I've become much more um, uh, I've realized the 
important links between individual buildings and infrastructure. The infrastructure of public spaces, of connections, of transportation, bridges, uh, terminals, uh, the, the kind of all the, the sort of urban glue that binds together the individual buildings. That's not to say I'm still not passionate about architecture. Obviously, I'm, I'm totally driven by it. Um, but the bigger picture uh, is arguably even more, more important. The master plan, the concept. Um, I mean, your journey here from Denmark will be, your memory will be the route, the journeys, the path that you took from your home, the way back, the street, um, uh, the connections, the terminal, the airports. Uh, uh, that will be, and, and that determines the quality of life in the same way that the individual building determines that. Or oh, it's a huge influence. I truly believe that we are building our ambition with society. If we are not doing that, and if we're doing bad buildings, we are showing a bad kind of society. And that, and that is a, that's a big issue. I think if you, took, if you took the component of society out of architecture and it became aesthetics like, like, uh, or artistic and only art, I, I wouldn't work with it at all. I think this combination of having this artistic aspiration or ambition and then the relation to, to the big issues in, in, in life and society, that, that's what the whole drive is about. And if you, if you remove that component from architecture, it just becomes form or nice space but it's not really interesting. It would be great if, um, if we could address some of those bigger issues. Um, design as a tool to uh, address shelter in the big picture. I mentioned the, the project for Duravi, and there the proposition was that you might be able to recycle, to add the basic services which don't exist, like sanitation, power, water, but you could respect the urban structure which had grown up in those settlements because they're quite, of course they have their darker side, but you have to remember that people have come, they've congregated in these areas because they offer greater hope, greater prosperity from, so, so the challenge of how you transform settlements like that, which relate to a huge percentage of the world's population. Um, and I believe that there are alternatives, more human alternatives, more subtle alternatives, to getting the big bulldozers, you know, raising it to the ground and then transporting those communities into, uh, into other modern buildings. So I think that the answer to your short question, which was a rather long answer, would be that you know, we've built airports, we're still excited by those challenges. We've built towers, we're excited by, by that. We're doing a lot of small community buildings, we're excited by that. Um, but the bigger issues are not really addressed by, by architects. And that's, we're talking about billions of people. And those are the people who need power. They need clean water. And how do you achieve that? So those, to be able in some small way to make a contribution in that direction, that I think would be very satisfying. So can architecture help to build bridges? Yes. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. And uh, I think architecture is a good tool. Because architecture is intellectual discourse. It is feeling. It is physical. It is workspace. It is relationships between people. And it has the potential of being able to manifest what you think. I think, really, in every aspect of life, in every walk of life. You need the balance between a certain degree of respect and humility um, and to do what you do, for me to do what I do as an architect, a degree of, of self-confidence. Um, 
because you are leading a team, uh, you're expected to. Um, and that's why I said earlier that I think one aspect of the architect's task is to be a good listener and, um, and, and to hear the many voices that um, the needs that that building will, will answer. And, um, and also to respect the process of making, um, the nobility of making. That's not fashionable. Um, but, and, and in that sense, quality is an attitude of mind. It's not how much money you spend on a building. You've got, you've got really three resources. You've got money, you've got time, and you've got creative energy. Um, and it's the creative energy, it's the attitude of how you use those resources as wisely as possible. And some of the great buildings in the world have been achieved when, in the face of economic hardship, some of the best buildings in the world are kind of overnight miracles. They've been created very quickly. Some of the worst buildings in the world have had money thrown at them. Architecture can bring a lot to a local society like mine. Um, I have to say that when I started to do architecture in my place, people didn't know the meaning of architects. And, and the word architecture doesn't exist. Um, but the way that I use my skill to create a kind of architecture make the people proud. People are self-confident and people feel they are so important and they are rich, they have resources, they only don't know how to use them. So it is a wake-up call. So my people are really enthusiastic and looking very positive in the future. So this is what happened with my, through my work. So my people are proud, simply proud, and that can deliver a lot of energy.